On October 1, 1966, McNamara launched a program called Project 100,000, which lowered mental standards. Men who had been unqualified for military duty the day before were now deemed qualified. By the end of the war, McNamara's program had taken 354,000 substandard men into the Army, Marine Corps, Air Force, and Navy. Among the troops, these men were often known as McNamara's morons or the Moron Corps or McNamara's boys. Military leaders from William Westmoreland, the commanding general in Vietnam, to lieutenants and sergeants at the platoon level viewed McNamara's program as a disaster. Because many of the Project 100,000 men were slow learners, they had difficulty absorbing necessary training. Because many of them were incompetent and common, they endangered not only themselves but their comrades as well. <laughs> Project 100,000 inductees placed in the lower 10th to 30th percentiles of the test, referred to as Category IV. Normally, candidates who place in Category IV are deemed unsuitable for military service and are told to return to civilian life. Project 100,000, however, was an experiment to see whether military entry requirements could be lowered. Ostensibly, the project's goals were to combat poverty. Lyndon B. Johnson had recently begun his War on Poverty program. Thanks to the GI Bill and other veterans' programs, military service can be a great way to get out of poverty. But this was a nice bonus to the project's other purpose. The Vietnam War needed more men, and lowering recruitment standards was one way to get them. Although about half were volunteers, the other half was drafted, and neither group had any business being in a war zone. The Armed Forces Qualification Test evaluated a variety of domains, all of which were geared toward assessing somebody's eligibility for service. As a result, Project 100,000 brought men to the war who were ill-equipped in different ways. Some had physical impairments, some were over or underweight, and, most troublingly, many had low mental aptitude often to the point of being mentally handicapped. Many were illiterate. Since this was an experiment, a small cadre of soldiers were also admitted under the program to act as controls. These were normal soldiers. Today I'd like to give you an overview of what happened. For me, the story began one summer day in 1967 when I was sitting in the Armed Forces Induction Center in Nashville, Tennessee. At one point, um, a sergeant came out to talk to us and tell us that we were headed to Fort Benning, Georgia to begin our Army training. It was at the height of the Vietnam War and I had volunteered for service in the U.S. Army. The sergeant asked, is there anyone here who is a college graduate? I raised my hand and he motioned for me to follow him and he led me down a hallway to where a young man was seated and he informed me that the man was named Johnny Gupton who was also being assigned to Fort Benning. And he told me, he said, I want you to take charge of Gupton, go with him every step of the way. He explained that Gupton could neither read nor write and he said, uh, he's going to need help filling out paperwork when you get to Fort Benning. And then he said, make sure he doesn't get lost. He's one of McNamara's morons. I had never heard the term. And I was surprised that the sergeant would openly insult this man seated in front of him. Well, in a few weeks, I would learn that McNamara's morons was a term that many officers and sergeants used to refer to low IQ men who were taken into the armed forces under a special program devised by Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense. The sergeant left us for a while, and when he returned, he had a big envelope that was sealed, and inside it were my personnel records and Gupton's personnel records. And I was instructed to take the envelope and when I got off the bus at Fort Benning to give it to the sergeants. Well, Gupton and I traveled 
by plane and, and by bus to Georgia. And along the way, I tried to make small talk with him. I, I asked him what state he was from. He didn't know. I found out later that he was from Tennessee. He lived in one of the isolated poverty pockets in the eastern part of the state in the Appalachian Mountains. He was very thin, emaciated, unhealthy looking. As we talked or tried to talk, I was surprised that he knew nothing about the situation he was in. He didn't understand what basic training was all about. He didn't even know that America was at war. I tried to explain what was happening, but at the end I could tell that he was still in a fog. In basic training, he was virtually helpless. We had to make his bunk for him every morning because he could not make up his bunk to Army specifications. I had to tie his boots every morning until one trainee had the patience and took the time to teach him that skill. He had trouble with commands like left face and right face because he didn't know his left from his right. He had trouble marching. When the sergeant screamed at him, he was terrified and confused. On the rifle range, he was erratic and dangerous with his handling his rifle, and the sergeants feared that he would accidentally shoot himself or someone else. Finally, he was put on permanent KP, that means kitchen police, that's working in the kitchen all day. Once in the military, Project 100,000 soldiers were treated as any other soldier, to do otherwise would void the experiment. Various human resource personnel wrote up anonymized monthly reports on the soldiers, documenting their progress in military life and in war. The results were not good. Project 100,000 soldiers were about three times more likely to be killed in action. This is not surprising, in addition to being physically and mentally ill-equipped for war, they were unlikely to qualify for technical training that would otherwise keep them off the front lines. As a result, many of them were used as infantry soldiers. They were also reassigned 11 times more often than their peers and were between 7 and 9 times more likely to require remedial training. Project 100,000 recruits were more likely to be arrested, too. For the ones who survived the war, their outcomes were worse than comparable men who did not join military service. They earned $7,000 less per year than their civilian peers, equivalent to a little under $16,000 today. They were more likely to be divorced and less likely to own a business. The reasons for these differences aren't entirely clear. It could be the trauma of war, the lack of access to social programs available in civilian life that weren't available in military life, the possibility that they would have otherwise gone on to complete high school and college any number of explanations can be offered. But this does show that the ostensible purpose of Project 100,000 was completely invalidated. Offering ineligible soldiers a pass in order to give them a leg up out of poverty through the military did not work.